Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Doing really, really well. Really, really well. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's great to see you guys here for our um, for continuation of our IEL Fellow Speaker Series. You know, one of the things that we've um, tried to do this year uh, is to uh, uh, revamp our programming um, by making sure that you guys get some exposure to some of the issues that are uh, happening uh, in the <coughs> United States and in the world, and by bringing some of the world's uh, foremost experts on um, issues of trade, uh, <laughs> finance, the monetary affairs, the economy here to Georgetown. And this is part of that. And we have really uh, some of the uh, great experts both in trade as well as um, you know, a, a real treat to have uh, one of the technocrats who are gauging uh, sentiment in the United States as well, uh, particularly as we go into full swing in a political uh, season, in case you haven't noticed, there is a presidential election. Uh, there is an election which has itself an interesting uh, uh, departures and in, in political stances from different uh, uh, folks, um, uh, particularly in both of the Democratic and Republican uh, parties. And uh, we're going to discuss sort of uh, both from a, uh, a political public opinion standpoint what those changes are and where they're coming from, as well as um, trying to think through what are the uh, potential policy changes and what kinds of changes could one uh, uh, see in the international trade regime itself, what's doable and what's not and the like. Um, uh, just as a, as a programming note, though, uh, we will be, um, a week from now, we'll be having also uh, uh, the ambassadors from Germany, uh, the French ambassador, the EU ambassador, and the Slo Slovakian ambassador. He's the ambassador of the, right now he has, Slovakia holds the presidency of the European Union uh, here on campus to uh, talk about Brexit. Uh, so yet another highly non-controversial topic that I'm sure <laughs> will, will not spark any interesting debate. And, and if you want to go to that, you definitely have to, uh, I would encourage you to RSVP because uh, there, will, there will be a lot of um, interest there. Um, but for our, our topic uh, today, uh, we have uh, the wonderful Grant Aldanis. Many of you have had the opportunity to get to meet him. Uh, he's held uh, senior positions in the U.S. government, including the uh, U.S. Undersecretary of Commerce for International uh, Trade. Uh, he is uh, very deeply involved in IEL, and we're always trying to drag him deeper into uh, our, our grasp, as well as with uh, Jennifer uh, Hillman, uh, who has uh, sat on the WTO appellate body, um, uh, runs the clinic, uh, or really our, our practicum here uh, on international trade. Uh, we have uh, Brian Pomper, for a partner from Aiken Gump, uh, one of uh, really the foremost um, uh, uh, law firms here on town on both uh, public policy, on trade, on the workings, uh, inner workings of government. And then we have uh, Bruce Stokes from the Pew Research Center, where he's the director of global economic attitudes. I think that for this kind of a conversation, it's uh, although we're, I, I, I mentioned Bruce uh, last, that he go first and to walk us through sort of what are the changes that we're seeing in the opinions here um, and, and, and what can we begin to think about uh, as, as law school students, lawyers, and policymakers when you look at changes in the political climate. And I know that you have some, some slides. Bruce. Chris, thank you uh, for the kind invitation to be with here. And it's great to be with some old friends here on the panel and to see a few old friends in the audience. I always love to come and speak at Georgetown because my daughter teaches law at Boston University Law School, and it's the one thing I do every year that I can make gives me legitimacy in her eyes. <laughs> um, what I'm going to share with you, if I can, is uh, some data we have on American public opinion towards trade and globalization. Um, what do people believe, and who is it who believes that? To kind of frame the discussion about. Uh, trade policy in the election and maybe a little bit about where we're headed on trade policy. Uh, just briefly, the Pew Research Center, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan, not advocacy group. We have this strange uh, funding priority uh, from our funder, the Pew Charitable Trust, that, which is that they believe that good public policy flows from good information, which I think is a very quaint idea in this uh, <coughs> political lecture. lecture. <laughs> But uh, nevertheless, they believe that, and they fund us to do public opinion surveys, not only in the U.S., but all over the world. All of this material is available on the web. All of it's free, but most importantly, it's searchable. So if you ever wanted to know, gee, 
what do the people in India think about foreign direct investment, particularly greenfield foreign direct? We've asked those questions. So there's a lot of material uh, available on the web. I heartily recommend it. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who care about trade, and I guess you wouldn't be here if you didn't, um, uh, I have to break it to you, um, and I don't know how to break it to you, but the American people really don't care about trade. <laughs> they have an opinion about trade. If you ask them a direct question, they'll give you a very strong opinion, and we'll share that with you in a minute. But relative to other issues in their lives, trade is every year. We, every year in January, we ask the public, what are the top pr uh, priorities of the President and the Congress this year? And frankly, it goes back way before 2007. And every year, trade is either the least important issue or the second least important issue uh, uh, and some years, the only issue that's li less important is climate change. So again, you got to understand, relatively speaking, it's not that people don't have views, and if you push those buttons, and certainly this election season, people have been pushing those buttons, people have views. But relative to things like the budget deficit or strengthening the economy or dealing with terrorism, this is not an important issue for the, for the public. Um, we asked people uh, this year uh, which statement comes closer to your view about U.S. involvement in the global economy. It's a bad thing because it lowers wages and costs jobs, or it's a good thing because it provides new market opportunities. As you can see, people tend to believe it's a bad thing because it causes <coughs> job loss and lowers wages. <clears throat> Be very aware when you're working with public opinion. Look at the question. First, you should ask yourself, is the question balanced? This is our attempt to make this a balanced question. We gave people a view of here's a cost, but here's a benefit. I can tell you if you ask a principled question, which we also have done, do you think that trade's good for the country? Full stop. No cost, no benefit. About two-thirds of the public says yes. Uh, so we, uh, we've all drunk the Kool-Aid. We all believe in the theory that this is good. We just aren't so sure once you begin to point out there's a cost and a benefit whether we, we support it. Yes. <coughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, we don't. We, people should jump in. Yeah. You, you know, could you go back to the yeah. very, very first slide? Real quick? Yeah. So, so is the way in which that question is asked, um, uh, an individual gets a piece of paper and they rate it, or is the question asked? No, no. You, 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 people are asked, you know, should this be the top priority? Should that be the top priority? In other words, you, you, it's actually the list is longer. It's like 24 questions. So you, you wouldn't, people wouldn't be able to say, okay, I have to look at all 24 and give you it. Because you, the reality, if you did that, is that the ones at the bottom of the list, people would, they would have already kind of given away the top priority. So that's, that's one of the challenges you face in, in asking these kind of questions. It, so it's the relative importance that's really important, I think. Um, we ask people in the spring, and I put this up because even though it's a spring question, I think it's relevant. We asked people, uh, we looked at uh, their preference for president. This was uh, late in the primary season, and how they answered this question about whether trade was a, a good th bad thing or a good thing. Notice that um, basically uh, the Clinton supporters think it's a good thing. The Trump supporters overwhelmingly thought it was a bad thing. And Bernie Sanders supporters were divided. And I can tell you, this goes back to the, the first slide. <clears throat> it's not so much that people care that much. People were voting for Bernie Sanders for other reasons, not because he was anti-trade. Uh, he was anti-Wall Street, or he was curmudgeonly, or he was a democratic socialist, or I don't know why they were voting for him. But the point is, it wasn't necessarily that they really, that they didn't like uh, his, they, they liked his position on trade. Um, we ask another question to the public, and that is, are free trade agreements good for the country? Because then you're asking them about an action by your government, not just that we're kind of engaged in the global marketplace and this is driven by business or whatever, but do, what about those deals where your government actually opens borders? Again, in principle, people support these things. Half the public says it's a good for the country. Now, it's down from 59% only two years ago. So, you know, things are not going in the right direction if you believe in trade. Um, my guess is, again, 
One of the limitations of survey research is you don't know why the respondent gave you the, res the question, the answer they did. They probably don't know because they don't lie awake nights thinking, well, if somebody calls me up on the phone, you know, it's going to be dinner time, but what should I say if they ask me this? No, they, you, you get an emotional response. And it may be because trade has, for the first time in my adult lifetime, been a major issue going into the, the general election. Uh, all of us were around when Japan was a big issue in some primaries back in the 80s, but it died as a general election issue. Uh, finally, <coughs> our issue is a big issue. <laughs> uh, so be careful what you wish for. But I must say, for years I wanted my issue to be the number one issue in the election because, hey, that was my issue. Well, now we got that. But anyway. So it may be just because people are pounding on the issue that, that public support has gone down and public concern has gone up. Who is it who thinks trade agreements are good for the country? It is young people, minorities, and um, women. Uh, stop and think about it for a minute. Why might young people, minorities, and women think trade agreements are good for the country? I would suggest it that to, it's because of the opposite. Who's against it? White, old white men like me. Who demographically in our country arguably have suffered to the extent that parts of the population have suffered from globalization? Who has suffered? It is old white men who had manufacturing jobs, who believed, you know, the two thirds of my high school graduating class that didn't go to college because it made total rational sense to go to work in the local steel mill because their fathers could provide for their family with a steel mill income, that didn't work out for them. Those jobs went away or they aren't paying as well as they used to. So old white men are now, frankly, pissed off. Uh, they think trade agreements are bad for the country because they were bad for them. Notice that young white men believe that trade agreements are good for the country. Again, <clears throat> why is it young white men, minorities, women, and young people in general who believe that trade's good for the country, I submit to you it's because minorities, women, and young people never had manufacturing jobs to lose. Yeah? How do you draw the line between old and young? By age. Uh, 18 to 29. <laughs> uh, that's the, what's the, the can hopefully, standard hopefully definition of... Hopefully it's above 61, yes. that's all. Hey, <laughs> I, I can call myself an old white man. Yeah, right, right. But in this case, it would be, I mean, all white men over the age of 50 are anti-trade. Yeah. No, I, frankly, I think old white men are over 65. That would still be me. But anyway, <laughs> but the point being that. That would be really old white men. Yeah, old, really old white men. <laughs> uh, you know, and frankly, I'm not sure this problem gets solved. You know, these people will die off eventually. You know, my generation will die off. And those, that frustration with globalization, which is real. And, you know, adversely, remember these people, they, those old white men experienced declining, stagnating or declining wages throughout their entire adult lifetime in real terms. So why wouldn't they be upset about that? Um, but young people who never had those jobs to lose see it differently. Plus, young people, I would argue, you, you guys are of that age, you can tell me. <laughs> You came of age and began to form your worldview at a time when globalization was a fact of life. It wasn't a question of is this good or bad, it just is. And so asking young people whether trade is good for the country, it's like, well, yeah, the sun coming up in the morning is good for the country too. I mean, why are you asking me this question? Whereas people my age had to come to terms with this. We had to kind of accept the fact that this, there was benefit to this uh, because certainly when I was growing up, trade was, I mean, products from Japan, they were cheap and they broke and they were, you know, you made, it made you laugh. Um, we ask people um, about uh, their political alignment. You probably all carry around in your head that um, Republicans are free traders and Democrats are protectionists. It is just not true anymore. Uh, the fights on Capitol Hill are still between free trade Republicans and protectionist Democrats, but those are fights of special interests within the Congress between business and labor. In the, party, in the general public, 
Republicans are, are the protectionists and the Democrats are free traders. But why is that? I think it has nothing to do with trade. It has to do with the changing demography of the parties. The Democratic Party is increasingly a party of young people and minorities and women. And the De Republican Party is increasingly a party of old white men. And they bring their beliefs with them to their political identification. It, their political identification doesn't affect their beliefs. So I, I think this is actually not surprising. Um, w if you ask people about free trade agreements and you split it, this is a more recent survey just between Clinton and Trump supporters. Clinton supporters support trade, uh, trade, trade agreements. Uh, uh, Trump supporters oppose them at, by pretty strong margins. Again, it has to do with who supports Clinton and Trump. It's more of a commentary, I think, on that. Yeah. Hey, Bruce, a question yeah. for you. I, I have no doubt yeah. what you're saying is true, that you know, yeah. white, white men have lost out many things. It just strikes me there's something else that the you know, women, yeah. minorities, young people have in common, is that they're not part of the existing power structure. And I've always oh, thought that uh, yeah. you know, in a increasingly multicultural society where you have you know, non-white male uh, candidate for president. Yeah, there, there, there are people who feel threatened and a loss of control. And, oh, and they may be well, right. I, I look. I this is the discussion <clears throat> about trade, but yeah. I totally agree with you. Okay. I think that if we believe that the Trump phenomenon is mostly about trade, I mean, I again to go back to the personal example, those two thirds of my high school graduating class who didn't go to college, they not only their life didn't work out for them economically, but they also, what does it say about them as men? I mean, their father made enough money so their mother didn't have to work. They have not been able to make enough money so that their wife, now their wife has to work. What does that say about me as a man, right? Or they, they came of age before the civil rights movement. So now they have to deal with competing with blacks. Maybe, God forbid, they have to live next to a black, right? There were, people didn't like immigrants in my hometown but you didn't like Hungarians, you didn't like Ukrainians. Now they're brown people or they're Asian people. I mean, this is like different. And, and those two little old ladies who live down the street and weren't they cute roommates? No, actually they're gay and they want to get married. You know, <laughs> think of the changes these people have gone through. I'm not, I'm not endorsing their misogyny. I'm not endorsing their homophobia. I'm not endorsing their racism. But this is much more profound, I think, than just economics. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, we, 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 we could do that, but I, um, I don't remember the exact numbers. It was, it was more striking with old white men than old white women. But it, there, there, there might be some of that, because obviously they suffered as well from uh, the economics of this. Um, TPP, you get the same reaction, even though Clinton has come out against TPP. Uh, basically, her supporters think it's a good idea, whereas um, uh, Obama, uh, Trump supporters believe it's a bad idea. Uh, the underlying issue here is that Americans believe that trade is good for the country. They believe free trade agreements are good for the country. They don't believe they're good for them. No matter how you ask the question, we've asked this country this question actually four different ways, not just three. And it repeatedly, do you think it creates jobs or destroys jobs? Do you think it raises wages, lowers wages? Is it good for the economy? Is it bad for the economy? We even ask people, do you think trade raises prices or lowers prices? And bear in mind, economists only say you should trade because of prices. They don't promise you that it'll create jobs. Economists don't promise you it'll raise wages. But no matter how you phrase the question, basically people don't believe the theory. They don't believe it delivers for them. And um, frankly, until it does begin, until they perceive that it delivers for them, uh, all the arguments that, well, you know, the computers are cheaper today than they used to be, that's because of trade, so you should love trade, it, doesn't, it just doesn't fly, basically. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, what? Prices. Yeah, yeah, it, it didn't fit. <laughs> we, ha we have a, the same uh, uh, set of questions we asked, did you raise prices or lower prices? In 40 countries that we've asked that question, only the Israelis believe that trade lowers prices. Nobody else in the world, in 39 other countries, believe trade lowers prices. So, um, again, um, as and a trade economist said to me when I explained this to him, he said, well, I guess we'll just have to explain it to them again. <laughs> <laughs> 
And my response was, talking louder and talking slower is not going to do it, right? People are telling us something here, and we better be sensitive to that. We better, you know, understand that they don't see it. Um, finally, just on trade, because so much of the trade stuff is about, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to yeah. ask you about, uh, I guess, about the price Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Price right. So, you know, they're seeing or caring about the great panoply of goods from all over sure. the place and probably do know about pricing. Yeah. And, and whereas an older group would be less sensitive. I mean, that's a good, I, 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 I don't recall, I don't know that if we've, we've tried to break it down by generation, it would be interesting to look and see whether young people were more likely to say that trade lowers prices uh, rather than older people. I, I, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, I don't think you should overthink it. You know, my experience politically was always that um, trying to explain comparative advantage is like trying to explain the infield fly rule. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like nobody actually <laughs> understands it. You know, it rarely comes up in conversation, but some people feel obliged, like me, to actually try and read about it, right? <laughs> in fact, when you're actually talking to somebody young or old, it's much easier to pull out your iPhone and say, Donald Trump says he wants to slap a 35% tariff on this. Do you know that its content is 65% U.S., another 30% Japanese, South Korean, Taiwanese, 5 to 8% being Chinese? Do you think that's a good idea, right? <laughs> you know, it's things like that that actually stuck are with the phone, tangible. Stuck with yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. 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 <laughs> and you can get a recall and a rebid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's things like that. I, I just the idea that economists, which sadly, in my own experience, have in some respects not helped us, because there is that instinct to yes. repeat it yet again, rather than <laughs> let's just make this very practical. You know, okay, single mom, Walmart, Labor Day, buying school, get, send her kids up to school, buying shoes and clothing. Does the government have the right to impose a tax that doubles the price of those shoes and clothing on somebody with that income, right? Yeah. You need yeah. to lay it out almost in those terms for it to have tangibility to and, and yet, for what it's worth, having you know, spent a lot of my time, early time negotiating all these textile agreements, you would say to the average textile worker, union worker, that would come in and say, you know, we want quotas on all of these imports, I would occasionally ask them, where do you shop? Well, I shop at Walmart. Right. You know, okay, great. Well, but none of the items sold at Walmart are made in the USA. So on the one hand, you're telling me you want quotas on imports, and on the other hand, everything you are buying is imported. Yeah, but we um, should we should also I, never know, forget that yeah. a lot of that shopping at Walmart is out of necessity, not out of choice. And I, I, and, I, I, I mean, as Paul Samuelson absolutely. once said, you know, the fact that you can buy a T-shirt cheaper doesn't help somebody if their income is stagnated. I mean, to them, the more important issue is that their income is stagnated, not that. These things, ish, 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 things are, are but yeah, that's, we're, that's a separate issue. I just want to share with you some data on China, because China obviously is both a huge issue in the trade debate today in the United States, and uh, arguably will be a huge issue in the trade debate going forward, whoever wins. Um, antipathy port towards China is at its highest level in the United States since we began asking this question over a decade ago, and it seems stuck there. You know, in other words, notice it would, it would kind of go up and go down, and it's gone up and it just stayed up. Uh, we don't know all the reasons. Uh, yeah, yeah. Does your data indicate uh, which issues are the most Yeah, yeah, I'm about to get to that. That's a good question, yeah. We ask people uh, what's their most serious concern about China. We gave them a list of things that they could um, uh, focus on. Notice that trade is three of the top five issues. And I can tell you, in previous years, trade was the top three issues. Um, uh, cyber attacks has jumped into uh, 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 one of the top concerns just in the last uh, uh, year or two. Uh, and and uh, uh, human rights remains strong. Um, I'm actually surprised it's that strong because it's kind of toned down as an issue in the public uh, debate. Uh, but basically, uh, people, when you, people say they don't like China and what they're worried about is something uh, it's a trade deficit, or it's they're stealing our jobs, or they hold too much of our debt. Um, and as you can see, uh, Republicans, for the most part, are more concerned about these issues than Democrats. 
So that's why it resonates uh, when um, Donald Trump attacks China by name on trade. Um, uh, only really on uh, environmental issues are Democrats more worried than, than Republicans. But that probably means because Democrats are just more worried about environmental issues in general. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I would, I would warn you, if, if you presume knowledge on the part of the public, you'll have your heart broken. But I would also warn you that you, you wouldn't be here unless you're part of the elite. If you presume that because the public doesn't understand things, we should discount what they feel, I think that we have to remind ourselves that people vote on emotion. They don't vote on reason. Uh, just as they go in the marketplace and they buy a blue car rather than a red car when they're the exact same car except for color. Um, you know, most people operate on emotion. And we as elites who, you know, are to what is it, left brain oriented and we're, you know, we're too rational, we've got to accept this. And the other thing you'll find is that human beings are infinitely capable of holding mutually contradictory emotions at the same time. So they will tell you two different things. They say, how can this be true? These things contradict each other. Well, that's just what, who they are. And the challenge of leadership is to kind of work with that contradiction. And um, uh, there's a lot of contradictions. Anyway, we, um, I've talked way too long, but we should go on to the, to the discussion session. What do you think? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was going to just raise one potential observation. And, and, and I guess this would be sort of tied to what you saw maybe in, in Brexit, and you could make the, the same argument potentially uh, in the United States. Um, uh, because I mean, you're, you're, this was an excellent presentation and extraordinarily counterintuitive, and so I'm trying to think of good explanations yeah. for, the, for the data. Um, maybe uh, uh, when you look at the demographics of the country and you say, well, you know, the, the younger you go, the browner America becomes. Um, and some of the people who have voiced um, anti-trade policies have also tended to, you know, the, the, the same isolationism or, or, or whatever you want, is also directed against immigrants. And so if you're, um, uh, you know, it, it makes uneasy bedfellows, right, to, to agree on one policy dimension, say on trade, uh, and particularly depending on how your anti-trade policy is expressed or if the anti-trade policy is part of a larger agenda, yeah. right, that includes as well an anti-immigration drive to it, then it makes it harder to sign on to one or the other because you think that your ultimate interest over time will be undermined, either that of, of, of you or your family. In other words, that the, that, that, you know, the anti-globalization uh, posture it is, is usually not one that, that's tactic, you know, it's not out there in, a, in an abstract vacuum, mm -hmm. right? It's usually as part of a series of things in which, in which folks say, okay, either people are coming from abroad, take our jobs, and manufacturing is going to go overseas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that could also, um, along with the fact that the younger you know, people can become more educated in almost yeah. every uh, yep. Western or, or, or democratic uh, society, which means that the more higher educated you are, the more you are able to certainly benefit from, um, you know, any kind of uh, skills divide. You're, you're more mobile, mm -hmm. so you can travel somewhere. So, you know, you're not as concerned if, if you can speak the language. Whatever jobs are accruing in the country, you're probably going to be better relatively positioned to take advantage of those jobs um, from a skills standpoint, maybe not from a capital standpoint, but from a skills uh, standpoint. And, you know, but, but, but that's, that's, you've certainly got me thinking. Um, yeah. Just if, if, if I could just pick up on that, because that's, there's a lot to what you're saying, Chris. The, the reality is, is that the anti-globalization has metastasized among Democrats as anti-trade and among Republicans as anti-immigration. The shift here is that now with Republicans, with Trump as the standard bearer, you're seeing a shift on trade as well. No great surprise, we're still talking about the same group of people that Bruce yeah. identified in both parties. Yeah. And the problem with a lot of our political analysis is it's horribly reductive. We tend to limit everybody in identity as a Democrat or a Republican. Yep. I 
think the reason this stuff is counterintuitive is because we're breaking up that dichotomy and we're saying, no, actually, the people who are most sensitive to this and responding to this in a negative way are in both parties. They're now migrating to Trump. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing a unity, actually, in Trump of this, both anti-trade and anti-immigration. So I think your, your idea about who's responding and who are the voices in some respects that are speaking to that issue, yep. are not going to be the voices that are going to be supported by the broader coalition of younger women, a browner America, right? I mean, it's just a sort of natural thing, but it's been going on for over a decade. Uh, do you think, do you think uh, people's sentiment is that there's more of a I mean, certainly, uh, our surveys, Gallup surveys, show that the respect for big business or business leaders is abysmally low. Um, and, you know, is that because they <coughs> ship jobs abroad or they don't, they pay their CEOs too much money or we as Americans just don't like big things? I mean, I think it's, it's a mishmash of, of uh, uh, and, you know, it's obviously all tied together. I mean, th there's this question that Robert Reich asked before the Clinton administration, and it's still the question is, who is us? You know, and, it, you know, do these corporations have our interests at stake the way we think they did in the past? Now, they didn't probably in the past have that much, but, but, the, but globalization has allowed this, this disconnect between their self-interest and the average American self-interest to, to an unprecedented extent. I mean, I like to think of, in my little town, there was a, one bank on the town square, and it was owned by a guy who nobody liked, and he'd walk to work every day, and you could just feel the animosity towards this guy. He was a banker. Who, who likes, right a, who likes a creditor? <laughs> exactly. But the point was his <coughs> self-interest and the town's self-interest was inextricably linked. If the town didn't thrive, his bank wouldn't thrive. He died, the bank was sold to a bank in Pittsburgh. Then the bank was sold to a bank in New York. Then the bank was sold to a bank in London. I think intuitively, the people in that town realize that, yeah, maybe they understand they get slightly lower interest rates because they have access to multinational capital pools now, but they also know that they aren't even a rounding error on this global corporation's you know, bottom line. So that the, whether or not that town thrives is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And that disconnect, I think, is probably also driving some anti-corporate sentiment. Yeah, I think Dan, there's a great question about data. Um, pursuing your line, uh, you not just know what the objection among Republicans or anybody uh, to trade in your data yeah. tends to where it coalesces, like if China is a big element, because that raises something that technically Donald and Hillary are saying, which is they're not against trade, they just, this is a flawed agreement, or a flawed agreement. In other words, the execution is flawed. Mm -hmm. And that gets to the point to uh, the about comparative advantage. If comparative advantage doesn't work, what's the point of trade? You know? It, it can be penciled out. You can, and, and if it's not negotiated properly, you do not have that comparative advantage gain. And so it may be, as politics lost in the debate, but the politics technically are saying it's flawed agreements, it's flawed terms that are the issue, not really trade in general. And, and some data would show that, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that may be why an older cohort is <coughs> more than a younger cohort, because they, they bought into the Washington consensus that arguably, they will argue, has not delivered. Yeah. No, I, I look, I think at the end of the day, I mean, People in principle think trade's good. They just don't think trade agreements are as good, and then they don't think they deliver uh, what they're promised they're going to deliver. So you're right. I mean, in theory, at least, I don't. I, look, the average person doesn't make all those connections in his own in his head, right? But uh, it probably is why there's an appeal for you know I can do this better. Yeah, you know, I'm a good. I'm a big businessman, and I know how to make deals, and I can do this better. Because it does then tap into, oh, okay, if you do this better, I mean, I, I realize trade's inevitable, but so, you know, we'll just get a better deal. Uh, now, the average person doesn't know what they even mean by better. You know, it's just that I, you know, I would, I would, I would not, my income would go up, you know, I don't, or whatever. Or these jobs would come back to America. That would be a better deal. 
just to add just yeah. the briefest footnote, which is that I don't mean to say that comparative advantage no longer prevails. The fact that Larry Summers felt, for political reasons at one point, to pull up this tiniest example by his uncle, Paul Samuelson, to suggest it may not exist, was just the silliest thing I've ever heard out of many things that Larry has said that are <laughs> utterly silly. But the reality is, is that there is actually another reason for engaging in trade, and it's an irony because this debate that we're having is actually not about the way trade is now conducted. It's not about how we compete in the global economy. It's also not about how we benefit most from the global economy, which is actually our company, our society, and individual workers have to be engaged in the flow of information in a way that we're constantly out at the edge of whatever we can do technologically. We need actually to drive the frontier outward to grow as an economy, to bring people along. And for social mobility, we've got to have growth. So at the end of the day, the irony is, is that we're having a debate about this that is actually about 30 or 40 years out of date relative to how the global economy now has people functioning. I mean, we trade tasks now. It's part of what the outsourcing mm -hmm. debate is about, rather than goods and services. And so in that context, on the one hand, comparative advantage applies with greater force than ever in a globalized economy, but also why we trade and why we, and I wouldn't even describe it as trade, why we want to remain engaged in the global economy at this point and how we might do that is the debate we should have. And I think that's where your question is going down. We're having sort of a, a debate here about a lot of things that are, are relevant politically. But ironically, a lot of what we should be thinking about as people who are engaged in your future is in international economic law, is how you make sure that the foundation legally and the institutional underpinnings for the global economy allow that to happen in the face of the politics we're describing right now. Well, it seems like the, the conversation is now getting a little bit more to the law and policy issues. So I, I think um, it's, it's, it'd be maybe useful to get uh, Brian and Jennifer in, involved in, to, to maybe, to the extent to which you, you, you know or can interpret um, either one of the two political uh, candidates, you know, if, if the idea is um, no one's, or, me, that, that, that in the political sphere, public opinion is not so much against trade in the abstract, but against specific trade agreements and how they've been uh, negotiated uh, and that they need to be made better, um, do we see any differences in terms of what remedial steps need to be taken um, for, between the two candidates as to how to actually make trade great again? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm going to slightly modify the question because part of me wants to say, you know, I, I, as I think Bruce pointed out, I mean, for those of us that have been around doing this for a long time, it is shocking that trade has become this big of an issue in any political campaign. And so I started to try to think about why is that the case? Why uh, is everybody focused on trade? And why, at least from what you hear or read, does it sound like every time you, you said, oh, well, Trump at least got a few good licks in on trade or the only thing that he came out of the first debate having scored any points on was trade uh, because he's denigrating trade. Why is that? So for me, I was starting to think about it. One is I do think Trump has been more willing than anybody else ever in our lifetime to pander to a lot of the very popular falsehoods about trade. Um, I think that's part of it. Second of all, I think you know he makes it very easy to blame foreigners. I mean, it is so much easier to blame foreigners for everything, uh, for the immigration, for et cetera, et cetera, um, and I think he is very much stoking the fear of all the economic change that Grant's talking about that's going on. So, he, so you, you get this triple whammy of making everybody believe that it is the foreigner, whether it's in the form of a human being or whether it's in the form of an imported good, is really the one that's driving a lot of this. And, but the question is, is there any truth to it? I mean, is there any sort of why does it resonate? I mean, if these were truly all utter falsehoods, you would think at some point they wouldn't resonate. And your data is suggesting that on balance, people think trade is good. So why does it resonate? I mean, to me, I do think it's where, where you started from, Bruce, which is the stagnating income. I mean, to me, that's a huge part of the problem, is that to the extent that trade is creating more wealth or you know, generating more growth, I mean, it is very highly concentrated in the people that have the capital and the know-how. You open up, so what does a trade agreement do at its fundamental <coughs> level? A trade agreement opens up a new market. It is a door that is newly open to a market, to a particular market for a particular product, for a particular service, for a particular something. That's what a trade agreement does. It opens a door. Who walks through the door? The people that have money and the people that have capital. 
Um, so that means at a bare minimum you are to some degree exacerbating the income gap just by who you're giving this new market opportunity to. So in that sense, I think Trump may be right that there is this issue of, of trade and trade agreements um, at, at least contributing to um, the, the, um, the inequality, et cetera. The problem I have with it is it's creating this very, very completely false notion that if you somehow stopped all trade, that these jobs that your friends from your you know, hometown are going to come back. When if you look at the actual data, you know, over the last number of years, somewhere, depending on which study you look at, between 85 and 95 percent of the manufacturing jobs that have been lost have been lost to technology. Um, they have not been lost to trade. They have not been lost to imports. They have not been lost to immigrants. They have been lost to technology, which means that even if you did, you know, stop all imports coming in, those jobs are not coming back. I mean, you are, you are not going to create more jobs. The other falsehood that I think it pervades is this notion that we're no longer making anything. If you actually look at the numbers, the total output of manufacturing goods in the United States has been going steadily. I mean, there are a few dips during the Great Recession, but has been going steadily up. So we are producing more manufactured goods than we ever have before, more steel, more textiles, more on and on and on. We are producing more than we ever have before. We're just producing it with way less jobs. Again, this then creates this notion of, so it's a much harder problem to solve. Because if what you're trying to do is create jobs and economic growth, it's much harder than to simply say, oh, let's stop trade. And yet that is the message that I think Trump is prevailing. And, and I could go on in terms of then where are the actual trade policy failures that we need to be addressing, but that's not where the politics are. Um, and I'll maybe stop there and turn it over to Brian on a more happy sure. note. Uh, there, there's so much I could, right. I could say. It's hard to know where to begin. Uh, and I do focus mostly on trade politics. Uh, I know the substance too, but I'm really in the, the political sphere. So I do think about this uh, quite a bit. Just to pick up on something you just said, Jennifer, you know, talk about how most jobs are lost due to technology. It's absolutely true. I, my own view, and I tell my students this, is uh, I think maybe the, the invention that had the greatest impact on how trade works in the world is the invention of the shipping container. Hardly like the biggest high-tech thing you can think of, but boy, it made shipping costs incredibly cheap. It made it very easy to ship things all around the world as part of supply chain. Um, people don't think about it in those terms. Uh, you know, and it, when you talk about the impact these trade agreements have, I think people have this total misconception as to what these trade agreements are. You talk about opening markets. Our market's are already pretty open. Yeah. So really, what these trade agreements are, like 99% of them, are about constraining the behavior of our foreign trading partners. You know, I, I like to say this because I, I think it, it has an impact on people and think about this. The United States generally has a rule when we do these trade agreements. We don't change our law. So we don't change U.S. law as a result of these trade agreements. <clears throat> So tell me how that means these trade agreements have some gigantic impact on the American economy. We're not changing the law. We're just constraining our trading partners' behavior. And even the most optimistic assessments of TPP, which I, I think is now synonymous with the devil in, in certain aspects <laughs> of our, our political discourse, the most optimistic impacts have it changing U.S. GDP, I think, by 0.15% over the course of 10 years. I mean, the truth is these agreements, no matter – what other countries they're with, they're so small relative to the size and scope of the U.S. economy, they just they can't possibly have the kind of impact that, that people talk about. Globalization is a different matter. And, and I mentioned, you know, the shipping container. If you want to go back in time and get rid of the shipping container, that'd be one way to really take care of trade with China. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we can't really do that. Uh, I'd say on politics, you know, why is it that we're, we're talking about this? I think in, certainly in trade politics, but in, in all politics, Generally, what matters is not overall sentiment. I was taken with that first slide that showed you had up there, and uh, you know there were the two issues that had the least intensity were climate change and trade. And yet, these are two of the things you hear about most frequently in Washington now. And why is that? And it's because the people who care about those issues are incredibly intense right. about their concerns. Uh, certainly on the climate change side, with the fear of climate change, and the, the anti-trade fear of dislocation, fear of losing your jobs, those people really care a lot. I mean, that, I don't know if you've done this, uh, this kind of data, but it'd be very interesting to see like, how people rated 
their intensity of feeling when you kind of do these. Because I'm, I am confident uh, on the people who really are concerned about trade, they would rate it as a very high uh, concern. That's how these trade debates are won or lost on Capitol Hill. Grant, Grant and I had the same job at one point, and uh, he, he knows well. Uh, it's, it's getting the intensity, the people in, involved and invested coming up to Capitol Hill one way or the other, that's how you, you get things done. It doesn't really matter what kind of the general populace thinks. I remember reading at one point um, some wag saying that, you know, we were able to do uh, all this trade policy or we were able to create this international architecture of trade because the American people really didn't care that much. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, they weren't really looking, so we're, we're, we're able to do it. Um, so uh, I, I find all of this debate just like <coughs> shocking and, you know, sort of terrifying. And, and to tie it into something else that you mentioned, Bruce, and it was a question on earlier, you know, why is it that it seems like TPP, unique in our experience, honestly, uh, as a regional uh, or bilateral trade agreement, why is it seem to be failing? Because we've never failed before. We've never brought up an agreement and had it fail. Uh, and I, I think part of the reason why is the, the intensity on the anti side has certainly increased mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a result of what I think of, Jennifer, you mentioned this, uh, this growing gap between the wealthy and everybody else, which I think, by the way, is corrosive in any democracy. And, and the, the, the resolution to those or the, the cures for that mm -hmm. is completely beside the point for trade. It's all sorts of other behind-the-border domestic policies that I really think that the next administration is, is really has to address uh, just for the stability of the republic. Uh, but on the pro side, you know, when you had NAFTA, you had a lot of companies coming up and really kicking the crap out of people on the hill. My God, we need this for the future. We need this. We need this. You know, you fast forward 20 years, a lot of those same companies, I mean, it's hard to even think of them as American companies now. They've got jobs in, in offices all over the world. They just as soon source from Thailand as they would here in the United States. So frankly, trade agreements, yeah, good in kind of the broad sweep of my business, but you know, it's not the kind of the be all end all that they, it once was when most of their, their work was here in the States. So Mark, that, those Mark, are my be, thoughts. Before we come to your question, just one little footnote to go back and answer yours, Chris, which is that as international lawyers, part of the reason we think about this is that we know that the law is made through interactions of states. That's why we study it, why we're interested in things like that. But the truth is trade policy and increasingly international economic policy is always about domestic politics. And so when you think about it and you say, I want to have a way of engaging in the global economy, that has to be both the principles that we think about as lawyers as what's the right institutional underpinnings, but then the how do I get there is all about building a, the public and political basis support that would sustain this kind of engagement in the global economy. And there I think it really does come down to the fact that when you have a combination of slow economic growth and rising inequality and a number of other features of where we are now, for whatever reason, you know, whoever the Democrats and Republicans respectively want to blame for this. But what it does is contribute to a zero-sum perspective on politics. And it's the kind of perspective that leads you to identify the other, whether it's Chinese, whether it is, you know, Hispanics pouring across the border. I mean, I kid the people I grew up with in Minnesota. Why are you afraid of immigration? Are the Canadians pouring across the border in some way that would, you know, upset you or something like that? But you feel it viscerally, and it's just people reaching out for an explanation, but always in this way that is about dividing up the current pie. Why? Because they don't think growth and mobility is possible under the current constraints. And I think ultimately, for us as lawyers, you have to be thinking about how does the politics influence. The classic example this is not from actually trade policy, but it's Kissinger as Secretary of State, because Kissinger had a fetish for Metternich, loved Metternich, wanted to be Metternich, wanted to move the pieces around on the chessboard as if this was 1815 in the concert of Europe. And the reality was he completely missed the fact he was in a democracy. And as a consequence, you had to be thinking about what the public thought about your foreign policy. Well, I mean, for those of us in trade who have to deal with domestic politics all the time, you would think we'd be better at this. <laughs> but, but the reality is we, in many respects, I think all of us, have played this game on the Hill, particularly we were talking about earlier with Mark, Chuck, and Jane, where, you know, you pass a trade agreement, you throw a dollop of money at a trade adjustment assistance program, 
But everybody knows that Trade Adjustment Assistance Program, that doesn't do a damn thing to actually foster the kind of adjustment you need. Much more profound in terms of the economic policies Brian was elite, alluding to as to what you have to do. But if we're going to make progress on this, we've got to go back to building that kind of consensus behind how we engage in the global economy. Otherwise, you know, the devolution we see from Brexit, uh, you know, the idea that now in my neighborhood people say we're going to go TPP my neighbor's house on Halloween rather than... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've gotten, we've, we've gotten to this level in terms wow. of sort of what's going wow. on. So, But to get there, it does require coming back to these basic things about saying how are we going to build that domestic political consensus, and that's got to actually start with being honest about the challenges the trade presents. Could, could I add one thing here? Because you're all Mark. lawyers who are worrying about uh, institutions and about trade law. And I would suggest to you that in your lifetime, trade agreements are all going to be about domestic regulatory issues. And so the opposition is going to be about sovereignty and control and people believing why are you negotiating our food safety standards? Because that should be under our control. And these are not issues that trade agreements have normally been about, that they will increasingly be about domestic regulatory regimes that for the average person have nothing to do with glo globalization and trade. And the, the, the sales job and the problem and the complexity of this is going to get so much more uh, uh, difficult because it's at the end of the day we've just begun to enter into this new and the TTIP this negotiation with Europe is all about that and it's going nowhere in part because it's run into that opposition especially in Europe yep. and I think that's going to be for those of you who want to be trade lawyers that's going to be the headache because you're going to have to be worrying about food and drug administration uh, domestic regulation and you know, Highway Safety Administration regulation, and it, it, it's a nightmare. And the people you deal with, the people you went to law school and ended up going to the, work for the FDA or for the, the federal, they say, well, what, is, what does trade have to do with me? I mean, I'm, my, my job, my statutory requirement is that I protect the American consumer uh, from unsafe cars. And you say, well, how are you going to do that when most, so many of the cars are now imported or whatever? I mean, th this is going to be the issue that it's going to be challenging for all of you. I would, I'd say no, and the reason I say that, and this is not just about the idea of, of Hillary's to, you know, appoint a special prosecutor at USDR, things like that, uh, but it's things like even the mechanics of how the Customs Service interfaces with the people at the ITC and our patent laws. So, for example, the ITC, when Jennifer was there, issues an order under 337 that says the patent's been violated. Weirdly enough, you have to go through an entirely separate legal procedure at the Customs Service to get that enforced. So when you think about enforcement, Mark, I think there's both that sort of high-end things. Are they being vigorously enforced by USTR bringing cases inside the WTO? And then there's this whole other thing about the mechanics of how we, within the government, take a whole of government approach to making sure that our rights aren't impaired. And then specifically with respect to USTR, i got to say I have a very strong bias and it runs against what most general consuls at USTR would say. The reality is, is that you need to treat this a little bit like Thurgood Marshall when he was at the NAACP. I know this sounds like a weird analogy, but the, the point is, is that Marshall was very careful in selecting his cases to push the envelope slowly and it, to make law, right? And we're now in a system where the bargaining element at the WTO is not functioning the sort of legislative function in the system trade-wise. And so part of your obligation now at USTR is to say, how do I select a line of cases where I can start to be aggressive? Because the success isn't necessarily winning the case. In some respects, it's pointing out the absurdity of where the system isn't working. Right? And so that kind of approach is foreign when you're a general counsel of any agency and you have to be thinking, like Jennifer once did, about you know, we have defensive interests as a country, all the other things that come into play. 
But I think the reality is to get to the point where the public would have some confidence that you're being aggressive on behalf of vindicating the rights of both firms and workers in the global economy, you're going to have to take a different attitude toward enforcement, both in terms of the structural part of it and in terms of the litigation the, the other, I would only add that the area where I think there's been the most fair complaint that the trade agreements haven't really produced what they wanted is disciplines on subsidies. And this is clearly where we're seeing, if you will, the biggest real rub um, in, in the trade politics is because of, for example, steel, aluminum, chemicals, a lot of these products where China is now massively, massively oversupplying the world economy. I mean, China added for 10 years in a row 60 million tons of additional capacity in steel. So that means in a single year China is adding the total amount of U.S. and Japanese steel production in total, gets added every single year for 10 years. So you have massive, massive levels of subsidies. And this is where I think among all of the trading rules, this is where we've had the hardest time bringing about disciplines. Because the issue is what can you do legally about subsidies? So, I mean, two complaints you can bring. One, you can bring what is called a countervailing duty complaint where you're saying the imports are coming into my market and therefore I'm going to put a duty on any future imports up to the level of whatever the subsidy amount was. So if the subsidy covered 50 percent of the production costs, I'm putting a 50 percent duty on the goods coming into my market. That's sort of okay and has worked semi-okay um, for those cases that are brought. They're somewhat expensive, difficult, lengthy, et cetera. But the process works fine. The problem is everything else. Because for all other subsidy complaints, that in, in essence just China is flooding the market and depressing prices worldwide. That's the sort of gist of a adverse effects complaint. The problem is what is the remedy? What's the remedy? If you say, okay, China, you've done this, you've now added uh, X million, hundreds of millions of tons, you're now 1.2 billion tons of capacity in steel, you got there all by subsidies, what's the remedy? The remedy is China is supposed to, quote, remove the adverse effects. And in the subsidy context, it's very difficult to sort out what exactly does that mean. Uh, you take, for example, the Airbus case, so huge subsidies case against Airbus, where the United States has proved that, yes, in fact, massive subsidies that in, in the end created Airbus. Well, what is it that Europe is supposed to do? I mean, if you take it to its logical conclusion, you would say, but for the subsidies, Airbus would never have existed. But you can't honestly say that the right result is to say that Airbus should shut down. I mean, just go away, not exist anymore. So in, in the same way, you're not going to be able to convince the Chinese that they should shut down their entire steel industry because it was all built on subsidies. That's where you really do have a, a failure, if you will, of the trading system to be able to bring about the disciplines that it needed to bring and where you're really seeing a lot of the, the negative consequences of the inability to discipline subsidies. And I'm not sure what the right answer is. Like I said, the countervail cases, it, you, could, you could bring them faster, uh, make the process easier, cheaper, et cetera, for everybody, but it's on the broader scale that I think we're going to have to figure out a different kind of a remedy uh, than exists in the laws today to go after to go after major subsidies. Can I just use that then to return to the question of uh, making trade great again? So between the between the two political you know, getting to to, to, to the uh, election, um, you know, uh, to the extent to which I've been able to interpret some of the different solutions, you have on the one hand this idea of a, of a trade prosecutor versus a, I, I guess a just a renegotiation. It's unclear exactly what the what the remedy would be or, or changes to the structure of the existing international trade order uh, would would be. But to the extent to which folks, you know, anyone on the panel could sort of spell out what are the two. Chris, there there are no solutions. I mean, what are you what are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> but, but let me let me just. I brought this because I just love it. Smart life. Life. So much. Country, there's I mean, always a solution. Yeah, you know, Hillary Clinton. Always a solution. The Hillary Don't you Hancock listen to him? Project. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you listen to him? So, so Hillary Clinton uh, said such totally outrageous and uh, you know caught red-handed saying such horrible things in those leaked uh, documents like. I'm all for free trade, but I'm also all for a reciprocity. And a lot of times, that is not coming back to us. Um, developing countries have to do a better job of improving productivity, raising labor conditions, and protecting the environment. Um, arguing for openness, fairness, transparency. Um, we believe in an open, free, transparent, and fair system with clear rules of the road that benefits everybody, a real competition. I mean, 
the nerve of this woman, uh, right? And, yeah, and the, oh, I just, like locker room I, I, Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but let me just read a quote from uh, Peter Navarro, who is a uh, trade advisor to the Trump campaign, a professor, economics professor at the University of California, Irvine. And it, I think it demonstrates the, the subtlety and the, you know, the really data-driven uh, nuance with which the Trump campaign is addressing this. He, in response to what I just read, he says, what rattles around in the globalist brain of Hillary Clinton as she flits from special interest group to special interest group with her money-grubbing hands out should scare every American worker worried about losing his or her job to offshoring. So that's the problem as stated. Uh, what are the solutions? Oh, look, I think you know, Trump is talking about revolution, right? Uh, Clinton is more evolution, right? She's not... It's a perfectly fair criticism to say that the trade policy that we have today is maybe not working for everybody. And it's not just trade policy, it's, it's domestic policies that we were talking about. And to your, your question about trade enforcement, it's a great question. Much more complicated, I think, than you'd see at the surface or consider at the surface. Because, I mean, it's not like there are a bunch of trade cases lying around that USTR isn't bringing, right? It's not like they've got some you know, big sheet in their back pocket that somebody's saying, oh, you can't bring that. What's happening, I think, is that the rules, and Grant, may, this may have come out of a conversation you and I had, mm -hmm. uh, but somebody smarter than I uh, was having a conversation with, uh, who said, you know, the problem with the trading system now with re respect to enforcement is that the tools are inadequate because you've got countries, most notably China, but I'd probably throw Russia in there as well, who are, are working in the gaps in those agreements, and we don't really have laws or rules that kind of get at that. You know, <coughs> we, we don't have a good mechanism to hold China to account for filing an anti-dumping case in retaliation for something that we did over here, uh, or taking hostages on, you know, when we bring a, a trade case. We, we just don't have good rules for that, and it makes it seem like we're just weak and ineffective. Uh, and you know what? We may be, because we actually follow the rules. I mean, we have a rule of law system here, and that makes it a lot harder for us to kind of use the bare knuckles approach some of our, our trading partners so, uh, produce. But when you say that, does this mean that the that the issues in which these folks are, are operating, uh, uh, the gaps, are themselves not subject to clear international rules, like a, like a currency manipulation kind of question? Hmm. Or is it that the, or is it that the, the, that there are rules, but for whatever reason, the spe specific conduct by the state actor itself is so ambiguous that, that it, it, it's, it's able to- I, I imagine both, truly. But, uh, but the, the irony is, you know, the WTO system and its dispute settlement, since we have the architect of it here. <laughs> but you know, no, 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 actually it's, it's a tribute chain because if you think about it, there still is a system that really is based on, because it's international law, contracts between countries. And so the system is designed that way, and it was from the start. It is not just about violations, it's whether you've impaired the contract. And so it does reach conduct that goes beyond the black letter of the law in this context. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is you have to start revivifying in one sense how you go after nullification of impairment. But I want to come back to the question about hope. Mm -hmm. And the hope here is to recognize that you have a much younger generation per what Bruce is describing to us, mm -hmm. and that the role of lawyers in this process is in some respects to cauterize what we think of as a conventional trade debate. It's Mark's point about let's enforce this vigorously, let's do the things that we need to do to keep ourselves engaged in the global economy. Then the rest of it is what I was alluding to, Chris, in our sidebar, which is you know, the reality of our being capable of engaging in the global economy is going to happen in areas like securities regulation. It's going to happen in tax, Jeff, right? I mean, our ability to get the international provisions of the tax code in a way that actually facilitates the ability of large businesses to engage without the distortions it introduces and the objections it raises, and have small companies be able to participate in their supply chains and go global along with them. So suddenly you start to say to yourself, I should reconceive trade policy rather in terms of tariffs and the things that we normally think about. Think about it, the transaction cost, the pure friction of engaging in a market. Now what do we do in this context across a broad front to facilitate the ability of both firms and individuals to participate and benefit from it. Now suddenly you start to say to yourself, well, maybe the smartest thing we could do is negotiate a standstill on encroachments on the Internet, because that's a vehicle through which a lot of small companies participate not only globally, 
but are capable of getting into somebody's supply chain. Well, that's not an act of trade policy that runs directly into the politics we've been talking about here for the last hour. But it is something that's absolutely and fundamentally necessary, and I would submit is something that appeals to that younger generation that is likely to be more supportive. You're already looking past, I'm, I'm one of those, what, was, what did we call them, the remarkably old white guys? Is that what it was? Or, <laughs> Very old. Really old white guys. Really right? old you white know? guys. So I was at a dinner where a friend of mine lost his stepfather. And it was a beautiful story, a classic American story, where my friend's mom got this guy off the bottle, he found the Lord, started a paving company, which isn't a natural act for a Christian necessarily to <laughs> go from religion to paving. But the upshot of it is that he starts this business, and it, it employs his stepsons, employs you know a lot of people, employs the guys who went to prison from my neighborhood, came back out, couldn't find a job. Right? It's on a scale that everybody grasps. To Bruce, to your point, and Brian's points, it's something they understand. The troubling thing I found is we're having this dinner, and I realized that all my friends who worked in the Ford plant that punched out F-150 trucks never had a bad year, ended up moving to the southern suburbs of Minneapolis and voting Republican now saw themselves as victims, right? And, of course, led me to say, I was there when you committed the crime. You can't tell me that, you know, <laughs> that somehow you're a victim in all this process. But the really interesting thing about it is that these guys, my friends and I, we're moving on. When we think about what this generation has to do, I'm not saying ignore it. I'm saying respond to the needs of the folks that are going to be the productive part of the economy going forward and ensure that there is opportunity there. And that actually is a much harder thing because it involves thinking about areas like securities regulation, like tax, in terms of how we engage in the global economy, which is not the way we conventionally think about it. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not the way we teach it. It's not the way that we think about it as lawyers. But I think that's where we have to go because for the, your generation to succeed, and certainly for my grandchildren's generation to succeed, that has to go on. In some respects, it means cauterizing this debate, the debate we're having about trade, mm -hmm. and recognizing it's the rest of the economy that's important, and that has to find a way into the global economy. If, if I might add here, I mean, it seems to me one of the challenges, let's assume that, I mean, if, if Trump wins, I don't know where the debate goes on any of these issues, but if, if Clinton wins, I know people around Clinton who have finally got religion, and they say, oh, we need to do more worker retraining, more apprentice programs, etc. And what I've said to them is, look, we need to address the pain and suffering of manufacturing workers because that is part of the populist protest. But what you really need to put in place are programs for the service workers who we can anticipate will face increasing global competition. They are the young people, the minorities, the women who work in the services area and have yet to face global competition. Maybe we don't quite understand what it will look like but I think we would be remiss in not accepting the fact that 10 years from now or 20 years from now, they're going to face competition from India or Vietnam or I don't know where. And we better have programs in place to address their problems before we get there. Or we'll lose that generation. Because they, all of a sudden, I mean, one of the explanations for why young people think trade and globalization is fine is that they're young and idealistic and naive, and they've never actually had to face competition of the nature that their fathers or grandfathers faced. And once they do face that, if they're like their fathers, their attitudes about like this might change. <laughs> and we better, and I don't, look, we've tried to do service worker retraining. We don't, we don't know how to do that yet. We don't know how to do manufacturing worker retraining. But I mean, the point is, this is going to be one of the, one of the challenges going forward, I think. A couple more questions, and then we're out with the market. Yeah, uh, I was just thinking for a terrific panelist. Um, I was just wondering, from, from some of you, so you mentioned some of the domestic constraints on, 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 on legislation internationally and so on. We've seen that there were on Brown, Stahl, and so on. Do you think it has anything to do with basically the internet? Is it easier today to create interest groups? And you have these sharing of articles. It's not filtered through the, the press. And we spoke about the disconnect between emotional has it become harder to have these grand deals because of the increased communication and we now are in a post-truth politics and so on? 
it, it, yeah. Go, go. I, I would say it's more the post-truth than the than the internet. I mean, you, you think about, it, take TTIP as a good example. So what happened with TTIP in terms of the huge um, outpouring of, of anti-TTIP support in Europe, an awful lot of it was centered around ISDS, um, Investor State Dispute Settlement. But you think about it, so where was it most heavily concentrated? Most heavily concentrated in Germany. All right, so if you think about it, again, rationally, all right, Germany is right now in 113 bilateral investment treaties, all of which contain an ISDS mechanism, and I would argue a very rudimentary, non-regulatory friendly ISDS mechanism. So on the one hand, if you don't do TTIP, you leave in place 113 bits in Germany with bad ISDS language. If you do TTIP, you replace the language in those bits with really good, forward-looking, much more pro-regulatory, favorable, better ISDS language. But the urban myth that ISDS is, you know, the devil absolutely incarnate became rapid fire. I mean, it, within the space of four months, um, we went from safely negotiating TTIP, everybody's saying, oh, this is an agreement among equals, two highly developed trading partners, we both have good regulatory standards, we both care about the environment, we both have good worker rights, this is going to be a no-brainer, to all of a sudden having this absolute explosion of opposition to TTIP over ISDS, and again, we can debate whether ISDS is good or bad, but the, the rationale for it had, was completely divorced from the reality. So to me, that's what it allows to happen, is a lot more of this kind of urban myth building that then politicians just can't stop and can't get in the way of um, and can't change. And as a result, you end up with the no. The, the, you know, it's far, far easier to stop anything than to make anything go forward. So those that oppose anything um, end up having more power than those that want to make progress that requires <coughs> affirmative action. And just to add a little framework around that, you know, when you're bargaining in trade, you're always bargaining from a mercantilist perspective. And you're doing it because of what economists call the logic of collective action. It's easier for the entrenched interest, right, to maintain control over the political process. They have access. It's low cost to organize. They get the benefit. For the masses who would benefit from free trade, hard to organize, high cost, and you can't keep the benefits of free trade to yourself, so why would you bother and invest the time? That's the framework. So we negotiate on behalf of export interest to draw another player into that that wants the liberalization to offset the folks that are entrenched and want the protection. Let's think about what does the Internet do to that. It drops the cost of organizing, but thus far, all we've learned how to do with that is organize, to Jennifer's no. point, no. No one, if you think about the protests against Scott Walker in Milwaukee, if you think about uh, the protests that brought down the Egyptian government, you can do things that have powerful effects, but what they don't do is place something positive in its place. And the real question is, how can you use this force for a positive end? Because we have dropped the cost of organizing dramatically. So suddenly you've changed the logic of collective action in some fundamental ways. It could be a tremendous and powerful gift in terms of liberalization going forward, but the key question is how you, in fact, use it for yes, rather than using it for no. And it's possible. I mean, I can imagine. I mean, we, you know, the old stereotype was always the, the problem with trade, trying to get trade agreements through is when a single plant closes, 3,000 jobs right there, right. out, Visible. and everybody sees it. That padlock goes on the door, 3,000 people are out of work, that whole town is now anti-trade. And the problem was that the benefits of trade is one job here, one job there, exactly. one job here, one job there. And even though those jobs might have paid better, been better, et cetera, jobs, there was no way to put those people all together and sort of have them offset the 3,000 that had lost a job. In theory now, you could actually organize all of the disparate folks that are on the winning side of trade, but there isn't really any thing around which to organize them. There isn't any, you, you don't, you're not putting them together to say, oh, we should all now be for TPP. I mean, it, it just you, doesn't work that but, way. But you, but could, but you could, Jennifer, you could organize around that single mom shop in a Walmart, right? You need the examples. And weirdly enough, you know, we've gotten to the point where unless we reclaim the moral high ground for the reasons we engage in the global economy, we won't succeed at the end of the day. And I think we have to begin articulating that case in actually moral terms. And I think it starts with identifying 
why Franklin Roosevelt walked down this road, right? You know, what he was trying to do actually was break up a lot of concentrations. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons he's my hero is he was also sophisticated enough to break up the Ohio political machine <laughs> that was all Republican at that point. But what he was trying to accomplish was a positive good end for people at the bottom that were being penalized by these concentrations inside the U.S. economy. And I think in some respects it's, it's really assuming the mantle that Roosevelt described and trying to put it in those moral terms that takes us back. And, and I do think that we should remind ourselves that people in principle, in our surveys, in the Gallup surveys, people in principle believe that globalization is here to stay. They may not like it or this, but they believe it's here to stay. And they believe it's good for the country. It's just they aren't so sure it's good for them. Mm -hmm. So you have a place to start from. It's not that people say, oh, this is bad in principle. It's just they think it's bad in practice. Mm -hmm. So there, there's something to work with. I remember, and, and why I think it's going to continue to be a, a salient political issue going forward, a, an old friend of mine named Paul Tully, who's, who's sim, uh, since passed away, but he was a big Democratic political operative. And I was talking to him once. He said, he said, I love trade as an issue. And I said, well, why in the world do you love trade as an issue? He could have cared less about trade. He could have cared. He didn't know much about trade. But he said, it's a wonderful issue for my candidates. One, it allows my candidate to stand up for the American people. People want their politicians to be tough and to stand up for them, whatever that means to them. They want them to be tough and to stand up for them. Second, it allows my candidate to show compassion for those who are suffering. Hmm. In other words, I can, I can propose plans, you know, to, to, to deal with their, their suffering. And it also allows my candidate to be forward thinking and forward leaning because the public does know that the future is coming and they want somebody who's thinking about it. And so in a way, it is a perfect issue for the politician who knows how to use it. Bill Clinton was that politician. Uh, other, I would say others have not maybe used it in the same uh, effective way that he did. Very famously, for those of you that were not around during the NAFTA campaign, during the, I'm sorry, during the Bill Clinton campaign, he went down to North Carolina and his famous line that everybody says is, we will compete, not retreat. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, became the sort of mantra of that campaign on what is the U.S.'s approach to trade, we will compete, not re, uh, not, we will compete, not retreat. Um, but we will live to teach another day. <laughs> uh, thank you for such a wonderful and interesting um, conversation. I actually learned quite a bit. Uh, I, I assume uh, you guys have as well, but let's thank our panelists. And we hope to see you uh, next week for, for breakfast. This is Forbes, so, yeah. but it's sort of this summary of a lot of this very interesting research. Oh, I have to look at Forbes.